All right, I think we're going. John, how are you? I'm good, Glenn. How are you? Doing well. This is Glenn Lowry here at the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv, which comes to you from Brown University, courtesy of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Here at Brown, Glenn Lowry, Professor of Economics at Brown with John McWhorter, Professor of the Humanities at Columbia. John, is that the title? That sounds good. You know, I'm not <laughs> professor of the humanities. No, the truth is, at this point, and I don't spread this around because it just sounds so incongruous. I am on the Slavic department's faculty, technically. I mean, wow. really, I'm weird, but it's Slavic who pay my salary. And it used to be that it was the English department, which made it sound like I was somebody who studied literature. So I kind of like that. But no, I don't have one of those titles. No, I don't have a chair. I'm not scholar of humanities. I'm just weird. But I have an okay. office. And this is that. weird, John, professor of Slavic studies or something crazy like that. Linguist extraordinaire, as everyone knows. And my conversation partner here, we are the black guys at bloggingheads.tv. John, is your uh, situation... Provisional? Do you have to get renewed from time to time at Columbia, or do you have the big T? <laughs> they don't give me the big T because there's no linguistics department who would be qualified to evaluate me. But what they've done instead is that I have three successive seven-year contracts, and it's understood that I could ask for more. And with the three successive contracts, including one year off every six years, that's until a normal person would retire. And yeah. so I'll take it. And to tell you the truth, I shouldn't say this out loud, to be non-tenured means that I have less of the administration than I would have. And, you know, frankly, nobody's going to fire me. So, yeah, it's a pretty uh, nice... Yeah, I think a lot of academics would give their right arm to be in your uh, situation, John. Maybe, yeah. <clears throat> How is life? We haven't talked in a while. We are the black guys at blackheads.tv. I'm sure our audience has missed us. Fill us in. What's been going on this last month? Well, you know, in my life, I'm just finding that um, to be the head of even a small linguistics program and to write for the Atlantic and to do my podcast, Lexicon Valley, to do all three, I'm beginning to find that I can't really do all three without phoning things in. And then, of course, I have this podcast. It's too much, and I'm going to have to cut something back, and I'm not sure what that's going to be. But, um, yeah, I've taken on more than I can do while also having, you know, two small kids. And that's a pretty luxurious problem to have, but I have just signed a contract to write. See, it's, it's too much. A book about profanity, and I'm about hey. to sign one to do an academic book about the history of the English language. And so, you know, I'm at the point where you get asked to do all these things, but I'm beginning to realize I can't do all of it and try and do it well. So I'm just beginning to feel overburdened. But there's so many people who don't have anything to do that I know that's a really silly thing to think of as a problem. That's, how are you? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing well. I, I, I will fill you in further after I inquire about these books because I'm very much intrigued. The big academic book on um, on what? On language? On the history of language? The history... The history of the English language, kind of by accident over the past history. 20 years. I've become history really interested. The English language, man. From the beginning, from when it wasn't even English on the European continent until, you know, basically last week. And well, wait a minute. Who does that? Nobody writes books like that. That's like, that's, that's a huge, ambitious, intellectually, uh, you know, st- no. In- intimidating project, no? I mean, that's the kind of thing George Orwell would have done if he had no. lived long enough. No? <laughs> not, in- not that intimidating. There are a lot of basic histories of the English language that, you know, and they're, most of them are excellent. A lot of them basically say the same sorts of things in different ways. It depends on what the specialty of the linguist happens to be. But over the past about 20 years, I've developed a lot of, you know, big surprise renegade views. I think that some of the truisms about how English has developed are just that. And I've noticed that really it's getting to the point where I have a whole story to tell that I think I can back up that would be worth putting between two covers. But it's not one where it's going to be a Barnes and Noble book. It's one that probably should be published by an academic press, even though it'll be readable. And I hesitate to start doing it because that's a big project. And the problem is with academic books, just like I'm sure it is in your field, Nobody reads them, yeah. you know, they, but they're, they're calling cards, but nobody sits and reads it from cover to cover. So yeah. you have written it, and I'm figuring to have written books like that in my 20s and 30s and maybe 40s, 
It's how you establish your record. To be in my 50s and to write a book like that, I'm thinking, why go to the effort when I can get the word out with podcasts, et cetera? It's a real question as to, you know, whether, for example, what you yeah. and I are doing right now, right. should there be an academic version of this? Is this not real? You know, some people would say, well, they're just these two scholars who are yakking, and it's not, you know, papers published in academic journals with statistics and refereed, so we're not doing anything real. I don't know if that's true. Maybe it's just that 50 years ago, technology wouldn't allow us to do what we're doing right well, now. Well, let's not make it personal it's for someone else to decide just how much we're contributing here. But on the generic question of whether people working in the academy ought somehow or another to be credited for the contributions they make to public intellectual life via these uh, newfangled media, I think the answer to that is yes. I do think, though, quality control and, and measurement is a difficult is a difficult task. With peer review, you're relying on the expertise of the people editing the journals to, you know, screen uh, good, quote unquote, from bad work and uh, yeah. thereby to give you something to go by. Uh, but with uh, clicks, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to talk about the number of uh, likes, about the number of times something was shared? Is that your you know, is that your measure? Because we're esoteric, right? I mean, that's what specialization is supposed to bring. It's supposed to bring a certain kind of esoteric knowledge that is almost the antithesis of popular, you know, the, the deeper it is, the fewer people who are going to really appreciate and understand it kind of thing like that. So I think it's a tough problem as to exactly how to do it, but uh, that doesn't stop us, you and I, from deciding how we want to spend our time since we do have the functional equivalent of tenure and uh, we're we're reasonably comfortable economically. Uh, you know, we can we can take on projects, but uh, for an American to take up the project of writing a history of the English language, that strikes me as especially audacious. Mm. What what do you think the OED people ah. are going to have to say about your <laughs> your plebeian efforts? <laughs> you don't that even is, speak. You don't even speak English. Don't even speak the language. <laughs> that is. Such something that somebody from outside of linguistics would notice, and you're you're right. There is something to that. Most of the people who write about this sort of thing are are British. I don't know if anybody would think of me as an upstart, as an American, for doing it at this point. But I know what you mean. I didn't grow up with quote unquote the real language. I dare say that you know another problem with the book actually would be another luxurious problem. It's not so much the American part; it's the Black American part. The idea that a Black American guy would write a history of English would mean that many people, without opening the book, would assume that what I was writing about was how people feel about their non-standard dialects of English. Whereas I would be starting with goddamn Beowulf and or even, you know, Germanic Old Saxon, you know, the stuff that I really like. And I'll be taking it all the way through to yesterday, but Black English would be at most one chapter based on really one or two things I have to say. But a lot of people wouldn't know that. They'd think, oh, he's going to write the black history of English. Whereas, no. And I think that to an extent, there'd be people who would never pick it up because they would think that the book was going to be all about ain't and Black Lives Matter. <laughs> and so that would be one problem. Well, those people don't know you very well, do they, John? Well, I don't think you've ever been a choice of, of talking black. Have you ever? <laughs> have you ever been? I think probably the opposite. People think you talk too white. Uh, uh, too, many. too white, everything. That There's that crowd. But then I did write a book about black English, and many people will very understandably assume that that's what interests me about English. So I don't know about that book, but I'm about to – I've already done the proposal, and I think it would be an interesting More book. power to you. More power to you, friend. And profanity. Uh, there, I think you might be especially interesting uh, because <laughs> that brings in some kind of social theory stuff, too. I mean, what is going on with profanity? You know, when people use what does it mean, profane? How does that get established? And yeah. what linguistic work does the profane aspect do, uh, et cetera? I can see how that would be, you know. Very All people have taboos and it's reflected in language. And ours used to be about damn and hell and fucking shit. And now those taboos are about, get ready, listeners, this can be hard. Get ready. You ready? It's about nigger, faggot, and cunt. That is our profanity today. And so I'm going to just take it from the Iron Age of the English wow. language all the way up to what we consider profane today, even if we don't use the word. And, of course, you know, the etymologies of these words are very interesting, and you can get into all sorts of modern issues, you know, the, the evolution of the word bitch, you know, so many books have been written about yeah. nigger, but, you know, I've got some insights on that. 
so yeah, it's going to be a neat book. I just need to sit down and write it. The chapter on fuck is frankly a lot of fun, but I've gotten... <laughs> <laughs> that is an eminently quotable sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on my tombstone. But uh, okay, so I, I, I get the idea that part of this is, uh, whereas uh, in a different period in our social history, sexual references or references to acts of sex or something might have been especially violative of whatever the implicit code is. Mm-hmm. Now it's derogatory uh, characterizations of, uh, of particular protected categories or groups, which we take to be expression of the ultimate offense. Whereas in, in, in the past, the ultimate offense might have been some kind of loose living or uh, <laughs> blasphemy or prof- <laughs> profane in a, the ordinary <laughs> language sense of the word. Now the, the ultimate offense is not being woke to the the uh, nuances of uh, oppression and uh, the hierarchy of suffering and all that kind of stuff. Woke is the word. And here are a couple of quick indications of how things have changed and how recent this is. I think I've mentioned on this show that in 1995, I did a very you know, passingly important, like it wasn't important, passing local radio interview in Oakland where we were talking about the N-word. And we said the whole word freely. There were white people and black people. It was Oakland, but no, this was not a highly black identified Black Panther sort of radio show. It wasn't a black station. It was just, you know, people. And we used it. That would never happen now. Or remember Eddie Murphy? You used what? I'm sorry. You used what? The N word? We we said nigger. I mean, I I have a cassette of myself just saying it with the other people. It was assumed that because we were referring to it, that was okay. This N-word piety had not come in. Or remember Eddie Murphy Raw. This is back in the early 80s. Mm-hmm. He has a whole routine. And I actually haven't seen it since then, but I distinctly remember he has a thing where he had offended gay men with something in the past. And he basically, as we now say, claps back at them and just basically says, you know, to hell with you. And he says, you know, well, you know, there's some faggots at every party. And then he goes into one of his imitations. Nowadays, even his equivalent, like Chris Rock or whoever the new, you know, Cat Williams, whoever, those people would not say that word in that context. No matter how salty they were being, they would not casually refer to quote unquote faggots for a special that they intended to be on HBO or something like that. And so it's different. Things have really changed in terms of how we feel about the slur. They have become sacred to us. Okay, now you are occupying a certain location that gives you an exemption here because you're a linguist and an analyst. And hence, when you enunciate the words such as you've just done on my show, John, (laughs) uh, everyone brackets it and understands that, you know, you're speaking as a, you know, it's like in a laboratory and you're looking at the body parts or something like that. And, you know, you, you don't imbue your reference with any animus. You're completely objective, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But... But the question I want to ask is whether or not your casual and easy and frequent reiteration of I'm violating the taboo in the service of an analytical project doesn't contribute to giving license to others uh, not as uh, refined as yourself and, and not as scientifically oriented, uh, to use the word as well. Is it, isn't the taboo, in other words, serving a social purpose? And doesn't your flaunting of it, which is what I feel you take a little bit of pleasure in doing, uh, a little to just needle the audience a little bit about their own sensitivities. Doesn't that somehow contribute somewhere or another, you know, the C word, cunt, the B word, bitch. I mean, you throw these words, the F word now, faggot, you throw these words around uh, in the, in the interest of uh, analysis, but you kind of are letting a cat out of the bag or a, a genie out of the bottle. Or... I know what you mean. It's inter- I'm, I'm feeling my way, like talking to you or, I was just at Aspen Ideas and Jeff Goldberg and I did a talk on a stage about profanity where we use the words in this way. And <laughs> the profanity was so fast and thick that the editors of the site decided very sweetly, they're not putting that up. And so it was a fun event. We did it at a bar that night, but no one's ever going to see it because it's just too much of, you know, all these words. And I, I, I get it. So I'm learning that when I write this book and I publicize it, I have to be very careful about using these words. And not only the N-word, but the other ones, because it's one thing to maybe say it once. I figure with a lot of them, to say it once to make it clear what I'm referring to. But to say it more than once is 
might be, in a very legitimate sense, offensive. Now, when it comes to the N-word, to be honest, I think that has permeated so deeply that little me saying the word a few times and taking advantage of the fact that I'm black, nothing's going to change that. That would be like trying to teach people that it's not grammatically real that you can't say Billy and me went to the store. That's something somebody made up. But people are so steadfast on the idea that Billy and I went to the store is proper, the way it's been explained with subjects and objects. Nothing could change people's view on that as linguists know. With the N-word, I think that's pretty clear. With the other ones, yeah, yeah, maybe I need to be responsible, like with the word that has six letters in it and begins with F. At the Aspen Ideas event, you know, me and Goldberg are talking. We went through all nine of the words. And when I said that one, even just to refer to it, the yeah. room, and this is, you know, these are modern people, yeah, many, many under 30, the room jumped. And everybody knew I wasn't leveling it as a slur, but you don't want to hear that word. And so one must be careful. You know, I think that has something to do with the fact that notwithstanding the gay marriage uh, law and the general change in social mores, the security of the equality of standing and the kind of uh, absence of moral sanction against homosexuality isn't nearly as great as perhaps some of these other areas. And so we're yeah. not quite as comfortable because we don't, we, we're, we're working on it. We're still working on it, notwithstanding the progress we've made, something like that. Although uh, I want to quickly insert in terms of the kinds of things we talk about and progress socially for oppressed groups, I recommend Jamie Kirchick's, uh, blah, Jamie Kirchick's article in the Atlantic from last week where he makes the argument that the gay revolution in terms of discrimination is basically over and that a lot of people in the gay movement don't want to admit that the battle has largely been won. And it's the sort of thing where someone from the outside might have their objections. They might feel that he is discounting this, that, and the other thing. But he makes a case that is definitely worth addressing. And frankly, he sounds a lot like you and me with the race issue. You and I, like Glenn, you said, and actually a rather long time ago in front of Coretta Scott King, the civil rights revolution is over. And I know what you meant. But when you and I say the equivalent of things like that today, what everybody else is thinking is basically Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice. When Jamie Kirchick says what he says, I imagine the same people are thinking of of um, what's his name, uh, Matthew Shepard. And they say, well, what about that and the things like that that are happening even today? And it's a rich discussion. So I just wanted to plug that here on Blogging Hits. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, my son Glenn is gay. We've talked about it here at Blogging Hits in the past. And he and I always have this uh, argument, really, because I'll say, in effect, you know, man, you, you know, it's pretty much over. You guys have won, right? I mean, you're in the clear. You know, the guy's not chasing you anymore. You don't have to keep looking over his shoulder. And he says, Dad, that's easy for you to say. That's easy for you to say, Dad. And he's just very subtle in the idea that it ain't over till it's over. And I guess, I guess if you have an institution like the Roman Catholic Church or the Southern Baptist Convention, there, right. you, know, you, right. might, you might have reason to think it's not over yet. So no. I, don't, I don't press that point with him too too, you ask me what's going on with me, let me just take a moment. I'm back from a month in the New Hampshire mountains, and I recommend it to everybody. Of course, you have to get a month off. Uh, it helps if you've got the big T and, you know, you, you, you get uh, June, July, and August to do whatever you want to do with them. Uh, and when my wife, Lawan and I retreated, we rented a house up there in a beautiful piece of land with a beautiful view of Mount Washington and just kind of uh, retreated. And I have been confronting the reality of the fact that, <laughs> you know, you keep writing books and talking about books you're going to be writing. And I've got one little book I'm trying to write, and it's killing me, John. It's killing me. Why? Oh, God, because the truth hurts. <laughs> because, well, this is a yeah. memoir. Yeah, I mean, they, they, without trying to give away too much. Um... So let me go theoretical on you. So this is the problem of self-regard, okay? So this is a reflexive exercise, okay? So this is a thinker, a writer, turning the lens on self, okay? So what are some of the opportunities and what are some of the temptations? Well, self-understanding, you know, and and a kind of uh, uh, freedom, you know, to, to be able to, to look in the mirror and, and take it all in and, and assess and correct and, and, and feel pride or shame or whatever one wants to feel about it. 
Uh, but, but there are pitfalls, and self-delusion is one of them. Uh, self-aggrandizement, you know, uh, whatever. So I, I've been discovering some things about myself, and I'm not sure I like them. I'm not sure I like them at all. Okay, so for example, I think I have to give one example. Yes. So um, I went back and reread everything that I wrote between 1982 in 1990 about race. Hmm. A lot of pieces in the New Republic and commentary magazine in the public interest and other obscure places and op-ed pieces and essays. And, um, and I came away thinking, oh my God, how transparently needy was that guy? Needy, needy, needing really? to prove needy. Okay. Like those people's approval? <laughs> the, the level of insecurity that I perceived of myself in those texts, the, the almost uh, uh, the, the, the palpable yearning, the, the vulnerability, um, the, I mean, I, could, I came away from those texts wondering, asking myself, was I really ashamed? Ashamed of Glenn Lowry personally? Glenn Lowry? Uh, as if I had this uh, terrible secret that I was hiding from everybody. Everybody thought that I was this brilliant, young, technical economist who had whipped through Northwestern University in two years and whipped through MIT at the top of his class, even though he was married with two kids, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and uh, had uh, sort of risen above it. I, on my briefcase, when I went to graduate school, I had two big bumper stickers on either side of the attache case, orange letters on a black background that read, rise above it. Okay. Mm. This kid from the South Side like of Chicago. Norman Vincent Peale. Somebody said that. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Well, it could be because I, uh, I got the bumper stickers as a result of one of these pyramid scheme marketing programs that I got roped into. <laughs> It invested a couple of hundred dollars, which in 1966 was real money, people. <laughs> and I decided I was going to make myself a gazillionaire by, you know, flipping these, uh, these little sales things and bringing on other people and getting 3% and 5% of what they got or whatever. I fell hook, line, and sinker at the age of 20 years old. I, was, I fell for it, okay? College dropout, knocking around Chicago, trying to figure out what to do. My girlfriend had given birth and was pregnant again. And that my life was, you know, in this kind of, you know, thing. And, and, and so I just determined that I was going to make something of myself. I was going to make something of myself, you know? And I, and I went to work, went to work literally at a printing plant and went to work at the junior college trying to get back on track and went to work in the holiday magic uh, cosmetics uh, business, trying to recruit people to sell makeup and skin cream and stuff like that. But in any case, a lot. They, they, they had an indoctrination program. And part of the indoctrination program was you get these bumper stickers because you're going to rise above it. And yeah, like Norman Vincent Peale or somebody, you write in your attache case, this little card where you have your goals. You know, I want to be a millionaire before I'm 21 years old and stuff like you look at it every morning before you pull that attache case down and you steal yourself to go out into the world and smash that motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? And, and like, really, Great. Yeah. And that's how I felt when I was at MIT. But down underneath, I realized I felt like I was a fraud. I felt like I didn't belong. And it wasn't until I discovered that I was really good at this shit that, you know, the equations just kind of danced in my head. That, why I, did, that I was three steps ahead, that why, I started to relax a little bit, but, but, but why, not nearly enough. What, what created that feeling in you if it wasn't about the ability? Because where... A, you might have that feeling if you know that you can't do what the other people do. You might have that feeling if you're socially uncomfortable because white people aren't what you do, which is what the problem is with, I think, a lot of young black scholars. What was your problem? Maybe it was the second part. Well, well if, at first, I wasn't super absolutely altogether sure that I had the ability because I was competing against the best people in the world, and it wasn't yet clear, although I did have reason to be hopeful in that regard because I'd done very well at Northwestern. But there was also a social class thing. I mean, yeah. I was literally going home to my wife at that time, Charlene, God bless her, and our two daughters, Lisa and Tamara, uh, who were just, uh, you know, five years old, six, seven years old. 
and and um, uh, you know, uh, making sure kids got the daycare and doing the shopping on the weekends. Everybody else was studying. <laughs> you know, I don't know how you um, did it. And then the black kid, the black people, they were all. You know, this one's uh, parents were academics. This one was a lawyer. This one's mother was a fashion model. This one was president of the United Negro College Fund. And, it, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. And here was I, you know, just a nigga from the South Side, so to speak. And I didn't really entirely feel like I fit it in and I was uncomfortable. But some of it wasn't circumstantial. It was psychological. It was just about me. This is what I'm saying. I'm discovering stuff about Glenn Lowry that I'm not sure I want to continue talking about. <laughs> oh, you know, the only reason the yeah. only reason I worry about you writing about that is because there are certain there's a certain strain. I have to put this carefully. I worry yeah. about young black people reading it and thinking, "Yeah, that's how I feel too." Where they're learning it from you, and they're going to misinterpret it as almost a way of feeling kind of validated. The idea being, "Yes, I do not fit." He felt that way too. And I'm not going to let that happen. I, 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 I promise you that. Yeah. Okay. So here's one line that I've got very clearly marked out in my head because there are two ways. First of all, I'll, I'll give you all this much. I'll, I'll tell you this much. So Orlando Patterson, the great sociologist in a, a profound book called Slavery and Social Death, Harvard University Press, 1982, argues that at the core of the institution of slavery everywhere in human history is the notion of dishonor. The slave is a generally dishonored, a radically dishonored person with no status in society. Such was the status of our ancestors, our African ancestors, in slavery in the United States. Such is the status of the freedmen because the advent of emancipation, that's a legal transformation, doesn't change the social slash psychological status of the subjects at hand they're still less than fully human. There's still something to prove, okay? Negroes have something to prove, have had something to prove. That's not fair. It's not fair that they should have had. They ought to be presumed to be equal. But as a matter of fact, slavery is a degrading, subordinating, subjugating, soul-killing institution. And its legitimation within a democratic society requires seeing the subjects of it as less than fully human. They've got something to prove, okay? We've got something to prove. All right, now, you project forward, and I do this, you know, in a cursory fashion because our time is limited here, but I got something to prove coming off the south side of Chicago in my own mind, if in nobody else's mind. If in the editorialist at the Atlantic or the New York Times, I don't have anything to prove because I'm the chosen victim that's one thing. But in my own mind, in my own mind, okay, now you combine this with certain other aspects of the biography of Glenn Lowry, like he liked to chase skirts, like he didn't mind getting high. He didn't mind it, okay? He didn't mind getting high. Uh, he came up on the south side of Chicago, and while there was a lot of brilliant, wonderful, amazing stuff going on over there, there's a lot of other stuff going on over there. <laughs> a lot. Okay, so he, so this guy, this guy who's got this, you know, he's already starting out. He's black in a white person's world. He's got a lot to prove. Everybody's looking at him, wondering what he's doing there. Affirmative action is in the background and all that. He's black. Plus, he's got this class thing where all the other black people with whom he might otherwise identify don't know what he's talking about when he talks about the ghetto because they don't, John. Sorry. Right. <laughs> they just right. don't. OK, they let's go, go into let's go into the housing project over there and, 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 and talk with these brothers about whether or not we can cop some of what they might be offering. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't know diddly about that. And it's a good thing, too. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't wish it on anybody, frankly, but that's part of my, you know. So so you've got this melange, this this complicated mix of different uh, areas. And, and what I was trying to get at is there are two responses to the problem of having something to prove. One is to dismiss it, and the other is to dispel it. Mm -hmm. Dismissing it is the high-handed stance. Ain't nothing wrong with black people that any white supremacy wouldn't fix. <laughs> yeah. Okay, who, who do we know who says shit like that? Ain't nothing wrong with black people with the jails overflowing, the welfare rows, the scores down in the toilet, the, the, the blighted lives, the violence, the whatever. Ain't nothing wrong with black people that white supremacy getting rid you know, like that. That's dispelling. That's saying... Racism, 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 dismiss. QED. Racism, right. racism, racism, QED. That's one way of reacting to the problem of having something to prove, to just dispel it, D dismiss it, dismiss it. 
The other is to dispel it. That's through performance. That was Glenn Lowry, just me. That was my whole card. Okay, when it came right down to it, I know library. You know what I mean? I know how to do that. I know how to focus in on a text. It could be philosophical. It could be historical. It could be literary. It could be quantitative. I know how to zero down in on it and get the logic right and make the notes and outline the thing and frame it and recapitulate it and grasp it and master it, mastery, mastery over my craft. That became my uh, avenue to legitimacy and to self-respect and to possibly being able to generate the respect of others. Except, of course, it wasn't a straight line. It was a crooked line, right? I, I had a fall. I had to, you know, I had all, the, all these other complicated things going on. And that's enough, uh, I think, to give the idea what it is that I'm trying to get. So this guy was needy, th- this guy, it, it, at, at uh, many different levels. And it, and it um, interfered with the clarity of my political thinking. And I'm not apologizing for anything. Mm-hmm. It, it left it a little flat, a little tinny, mm-hmm. a, a little... Uh, unsubtle in ways that it needed to be subtle, subtler than what it was, a little susceptible to being uh, manipulated and appropriated in ways that I might not have entirely wanted to credit. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at stuff like uh, I have a public conversion to Christianity, and I do this after having gone through a traumatic personal crisis in my life, being accused of crimes, being humiliated publicly. And it never occurred to me how that must have looked to other people, many other people. You know, oh, he's come to Jesus now. And then I'm preaching. Mm-hmm. I, I found this piece that my late wife, Linda Lowry, may she rest in peace, who had been in graduate school with me. And after my first marriage broke up, she and I got together and, and we ultimately married. We have these two fine sons, one of whom I've mentioned here. Um, but she and I wrote a piece together. In the early 1990s, that was published in the Brookings Review. That's the Brookings Institution, Washington, D.C., Venerable White Shoe uh, Public Policy, Foreign Policy Think Tank. And it's about faith. It's about our faith. It's about our belief that faith was one component of the civil, not civic, but of the, of the private uh, the Gemeinschaft, you know, kind of uh, 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 structures of, of society that was needed to bring back uh, African-American society. That was an important, not a public policy matter, not that we were trying to proselytize, but we were, we were extolling the virtues of it. Linda had done some quantitative research showing that kids who attended church on a regular basis while seniors in high school tended to complete more years of education in adulthood than kids who did not. And one would imagine that was indirect evidence that faith might uh, have some, but it was a, it was a thoughtful, interesting piece, but we quote from the Bible in it. We point out that our second son's name is Nehemiah. And that's a a figure in the Hebrew Bible of historical significance that, and that's not an accident. We named them that because we had something specific in mind and we're writing this stuff about faith and that's all good. It's all well and good. There's nothing wrong with it except the very same guy. And in fact, within the very same marriage, had been living in ways that were entirely inconsistent with the uh, promptings and the, and the teachings of a, of a life within faith. Okay, he converted. Okay, fine. Still, uh, he's, he's, he's uh, complicated, and uh, as I say, he's a needy, he's a needy fellow. Mm. Uh, so there's stuff like that. There's, there's a lot of stuff like that, John. You have led, it's, sound, it's not going to come out right, you have led such a more interesting, no, not interesting, richer life than I will ever lead. And I really look forward to the memoir because you've had hills and valleys. You've had an experience that, frankly, nobody else has had. Nobody, black, white, anything. You know, your trajectory is perfectly eccentric. And you've come through it, but boy, there must have been a lot in there, including children, raising children throughout all of this. Three very different women, if I may. I mean, those are three extremely different people. And, you know, the first one is not available to me, but still. That's, um, I am, I am floored. You are going to finish it, aren't you? Yeah, man, I'm going to finish it, goddammit. 
<laughs> I'm going to finish it. I'm going to finish a draft of it before I have to start teaching in September. This I'm on the fire. Blogging heads we've ever done. But how far are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, here's what I have. I have a, a couple of documents that I'm calling memoir fragments, where I have taken uh, particular points of departure. Okay. So one of them has to do with. <laughs> I'll tell you about three of them. One of them has to do with recovering from drug addiction. The halfway house where I lived for six months while my, my wife, Linda, was carrying our first son, Glenn the uh, second. And AA meetings, the first AA meeting that I went to, which I have a long description of. Um, the first, not the first one I went to, the first one I went to where I really shared from my heart and I had an epiphany at an AA meeting about what it was going to take for me to not use cocaine again. About the halfway house where I lived for five and a half months under the supervision of a very tough taskmaster named Robert Brown, an Irish Catholic converted to evangelical Protestantism, former uh, disgraced Boston police officer and former drunk who cleaned up his act and made his life the work of his life, helping other men get sober, not use drugs, not use alcohol. Bob Brown, I owe my life to him. Uh, but he used the N-word on me one day, John, in a way that just blew my mind. And I've, I've spoken of that here before in a conversation with Robert Wright at Blogging Heads. Did he do that to get you going? Or yes. Was yeah. Yeah. I was in a meeting with my counselor who was working under Bob's supervision. And Bob popped in the meeting and he listened to me. And I was snowing the counselor because I knew every chapter and every verse of the Bible, which was the recovery book uh, that we read, you know, the AA book. And I knew it all, man. I could recite it backwards. And. Uh, Bob listened to this for a while, and he said, okay, you're very smart, Professor Lowry. I want you to ask me one question. What were you doing in the streets of Boston, showing your ass just like a nigger from the projects? <laughs> okay, he asked me that. Damn. And, and I had a choice. Again, I repeat myself here, but it's okay. Uh, the choice was either to walk with righteous indignation. I mean, I can't believe you said that to me. Man, fuck you. I'm out of here. There was nothing keeping me there. Or to think about it for a minute and realize I had no clue what was the answer to the question posed. I didn't know why I was out there doing what I was doing, risking my life and everything. Uh, for what? I didn't know what that was about. I didn't have a clue. And I wasn't sure I wasn't going to go back to doing it again because I had already relapsed a couple of times. So I stayed put. I sucked it up. I took it. Okay. So I've got extended uh, treatment of that. Uh, I've also got extended treatment. What do I mean by extended treatment? I mean like 30 or 40 pages of text where I try to go into, you know, uh, depth of uh, exploration, which is going to have to be carefully edited and put together with the rest of it. What else I've got is uh, born again. Baptized a Christian in April of 1989 with my infant son, Glenn, looking on. He was three months old. And my dear friend, the late uh, great economist Thomas Schelling and his wife, Alice, uh, at the Dorchester Temple Baptist Church, which our church, Bethel AME, had uh, rented because we didn't yet have a cathedral or a sanctuary. All we had was a uh, school gymnasium where I would go in in the morning and help set up chairs. But uh, we had uh, rented the uh, baptismal uh, apparatus at the Dorchester Temple Baptist Church in uh, Boston. And uh, there I was. Uh, and there was the Reverend uh, Kenny Robinson from Nashville, Tennessee, who was the guest preacher, preaching a sermon about uh, the Ethiopian eunuch being met by one of the apostles on the road and being converted to Christianity on the spot, being baptized on that spot. And I talk all about that, but I, I talk about the, what I, I feel was, I have to admit now, and this is, you know, this is theologically sensitive stuff, but what I feel was actually a beneficial uh, period of self-delusion. Like I say, the issue is self-regard. The, the issue is reflexive. The issue is looking at oneself honestly. And how did I persuade myself to believe the literal claims of Christianity, which is that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead? that he lives still, that a man died and was raised. I believed it literally, or at least I thought that I did. I no longer do. I can't make myself believe that that's true. That's belief in magic. I don't believe in magic. That's, that's belief in magic and supernatural. I don't believe in supernatural. I want evidence. I want reasons. Exactly. Okay? 
But I did believe it, John, for a period. I, mm -hmm. I persuaded myself that I believed it. It was instrumental in settling my life and framing my life and allowing me to get my footing again and maintaining the marriage with Linda that was on the rocks and giving a foundation. Um, the discipline, the study, the prayer, the worship, the fellowship with other saints, um, even the receipt of the Holy Ghost, you know, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the expression of charismatic gifts and speaking in tongues and the ecstasy that would break out in the midst of a, of a worship, the cacophony of prayer groups in all different parts of the sanctuary, uncoordinated with one another, but inspired by the, uh, by the uh, uh, minister who's uh, lost in some kind of almost, uh, uh, you know, psychedelic kind of uh, trance as they are swept up by the spirit of the Lord. I was there, John, professor of economics at Boston University, a PhD from MIT, right in the midst of it, and not batting an eye, going right along with it, being swept up with it. What was that? What was that? So I've, I've, I've got a lot uh, on that. Um, and I've also uh, been sketching and developing uh, my uh, critical assessment of my break with the right. About which, you know, I mean, again, this is more than perhaps anybody wants to know about me, but I was on the right, you know, in the 80s and in the early 90s, and I broke with a lot of those people. I broke with Abigail and Stephen Thernstrom. I broke with Charles Murray. Uh, I broke with the American Enterprise Institute. I broke with Clarence Thomas and Shelby Steele. We had all thought we were on the same page about affirmative action, but I changed, I equivocated, I compromised. I, as it were, went over to the other side. I attacked Charles Murray in the pages of the New Republic, basically calling him a racist. Um, I wrote this 7,000-word review of Abigail and Stephen Thurstrom's book, American Black and White, which uh, Jack Beatty was I remember writing. that well. That was at the Atlantic, the old Atlantic. And, you know, it, I mean, it reads pretty well, even in retrospect. I'm not ashamed <laughs> of the review. It was a good piece of writing. But, but uh, these were my friends, John. They stuck with me through this horrible ordeal of my own public humiliation when I was at Harvard. They stuck with me. They invited me back. They still wanted me to write for their magazines and come to their dinner parties. And I played a race card on them, John. I played a race card on them because, see, here's the thing. When you're on the right in American high culture, you're an outsider if in the university, in the, in the world of the arts, in the world of yeah. culture and so forth. You're an outsider. We were all outsiders together, me and these neocon friends of mine. Mm -hmm. But I'm black. Mm -hmm. I had an exit strategy from the ostracism of the cognoscenti who run American culture based on the apostasy of my views. I had an exit card and I played it. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't blame these people if they felt betrayed because they were betrayed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not that I had to agree with, not that I can't change my mind. The book I'm writing is called Changing My Mind. Not that I can't change my mind. Of course I can change my mind about affirmative action, but that was not the point. I know what was going on with me. Mm -hmm. And part of it was I was trying to rehabilitate myself. And when I look here now in the year 2019 and I see the sorry state into which the racial discourse has fallen, notwithstanding your best efforts. I'm ashamed of having not, you know, of having lost my nerve. Because 20 years has gone by and we're still talking about the same stupid shit. Bussing? You have got to be kidding me. And not a single Democrat has the courage to say, you know what? It's not so obvious that bussing was a good strategy. You know, the, you ever hear a guy named James S. Coleman, he used to be a sociologist. He's dead. Uh, mm -hmm. He wrote something called the Coleman Report. It had a small influence back in the 60s and 70s. He had a whole sideline of research establishing that busing caused white flight. Do you know that he was called a Nazi at the American Sociological Association meetings for saying that? When in mm -hmm. retrospect, it's plainly true. Mm -hmm. okay? Joe Biden, here's what I'm trying to say, and this is just a side point. Joe Biden's got the better of that argument. Being against forced busing is now going to be equated to being a white supremacist? Are you kidding me? Nobody cares about policy. They don't care about history. They don't care about facts or evidence. 
All they care about is virtue signaling and um, calling people, uh, uh, you know, to some kind of, uh, uh, you know, phony moral high ground. It's phony. There's a serious education problem here to which, okay, charter schools is an answer and busing is not. Well, you're here. Actually, that's an interesting point because I've been thinking about it. Um, Kamala Harris attacking Joe Biden first on his supposed praise of segregationist congressmen. Yeah. And then, then the busing. And, you know, the truth is this. It, it, it's, it's layered in that. I used to think, and it's funny, I knew this from the Thernstroms you mentioned then. I used to think 15 years ago that the answer on busing was that – it's a good looking idea, but there was no proof that it ever actually improved academic performance. But, you know, there's been research done since then, which shows pretty responsibly that and I'm actually going to agree with you in a second. But shows pretty responsibly that people who were bust starting in the early 70s did, on the average, do better and not by just a little in school than people who weren't, as in black, black students who weren't. Now, that is a fact, and I think that is why people like you and me can't dismiss busing in that facile way that maybe we used to, but here's the thing. God bless Kamala Harris overall, but I seriously doubt if she or any of her people have been following those studies. And the way that debate has been conducted, is that busing is successful if the schools aren't segregated. As if the very fact that after busing happens, you have less segregation when some people go around and do a head count, then the policy is successful just because, oh golly, everybody needs to sit together. Which, frankly, is infantile. It's also possibly anti-black in that it implies that all black kids in a school can't possibly learn well, and or that even in 1969, all black kids were still living in one-room schoolhouses, you know, three to a book, which was not true by 1969, even in the South. And it also implies that head counts in general are something that we're going to have a moral argument about, as if the whole thing about busing was just that white kids and black kids would be sitting next to each other for some vague, idealistic kind of reason. The issue should be whether it improved performance. And, of course, nobody brought that up during the debate. I mean, yeah. Biden, frankly, wasn't quick enough to bring up that that's what the real issue should be about and maybe mention studies. I don't think Kamala Harris was thinking about it. It ended up being a cheap trick. It ended up being, aren't you in favor of white kids and black kids mixing together? Kamala Harris didn't say, I learned better by being one of those kids. She just said she got on a bus. No, I mean, I want to see the research that you're referring to because I'm not convinced uh, just as a matter of social science that the causal effect of busing was in, in beneficial in the ways that you say, and this is a painting with a very broad brush. Um, I remember, I don't know, um, uh, Anthony Lucas's book, Common Ground, about the busing controversy in Boston in the 1970s. Um, I didn't see a whole lot of good coming out of that. Uh, look it up right now. The book or the studies? The studies, because okay. really yeah, I don't doubt that they exist, I, and I want to see them. So please, uh, I'll, I'll uh, educate myself about this. But I want to agree with you that it wasn't about the facts at all. It was about the fact that this, you know, he opposed busing. Well, who opposed busing? We know that uh, the kind of people who voted for Donald Trump today are the ones who would have been opposing busing. Glenn, Glenn, very uh, quickly, yeah. Everybody, look up the work of Rucker Johnson. He oh yeah, he's an economist, Rucker Johnson. Yeah. Okay, and right. I, don't, I know who he is. Dismiss. Anyway, go ahead. Okay, well, no, I'm not dismissing it, and it's only one study, etc. <clears throat> um, but um, uh, what I was on my way to trying to say was when I think back on my own break with the right and the issues that were prominent in the 1990s, uh, I have regret because when I look at the racial uh, political discussion today, it seems that some of the positions that um, – that we on the right were taking have been shown to be basically correct. Um, I chastised the Thurstroms in that review in the Atlantic. It's in 1997. Their book is called America in Black and White. I chastised them for shooting fish in a barrel. In so many words, I say, look, man, nobody takes these leftists really seriously. Nobody really cares about what they say. Why are you so bent on refuting them and refuting them? It's not good enough to be right about liberals having been wrong 
What do you have to say that's constructive and affirmative about the problem? Don't we care about trying to make things better for these people, not simply uh, refuting these uh, people who are running around uh, spouting these, uh, these silly uh, things that they're spouting, I said, about the leftists. Well, those leftists have won or, or have held their own ground for a quarter century. They, they are in charge. Uh, uh, so uh, I was just wrong in my assessment of what the drift of the, of the uh, thing was. And I was, I was trying to carve out space that doesn't exist space to be mugged by reality as a neoconservative, but still to want to make things better. Who are you going to work with? Well, Glenn, let me ask you. There's nobody to work with in that space. It's something that you've written about that, that phase in your life. Because it's funny, that list of people that you gave, of course, I know all of them, many of them well. And I haven't broken officially with any of them. I'm not sure what's up between me and the Thernstroms, but nothing officially happened. And... I know that Myron Magnet of the yeah. Manhattan Institute has told somebody that I was a great disappointment to the Manhattan Institute, and that's the way Myron would put it, because he's an asshole. I imagine that <laughs> other people, and yes, I said it, folks, and blogging heads people, please do not. Okay, it's that. out there, it's out but there. the other people at the Manhattan Institute are not assholes. I'm sure many of them think that of me as well, but there hasn't been a break, and I still drop by events of theirs sometimes where I feel like I have something constructive to say, such as you do. And I remember you saying something probably in your New York Times magazine interview piece, that wonderful piece that they did focusing the camera on you back in, I imagine it would be 2000, 2001? No, it was 2002, yeah. uh, January 2002, Adam Schatz, the piece was called About right. Face. Right, and he had actually, he had, that same person had hung the Thernstroms out to dry, made his way into their house, drank their tea, made them think that he was a nice person, and then wrote a piece that made them both look like Hitler. I I couldn't I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, but he, and and if that's, if I have the name wrong, I apologize for Adam Schatz, but I'm pretty sure it was him. So you said, um back in the day, that you broke with those people because you, after a while, realized that they weren't really concerned about the black people they were pretending to be concerned about. That, you know, basically, what I took from what you said in the piece, and something I've always kind of had my eye out for, is, is their message really that if black people don't summon their leaders, whoever those people are, to, you know, get them all together to shape up. If black people don't shape up themselves based on efforts from within the community, then frankly, we owe nothing to them. And that is what some of those people mean. But the question is whether that is really the right's entire message on race. And I don't think it is. I don't think that all of those initiatives and ideas and articles and meetings are all some sort of puppet show and that what they're really just saying is fuck them unless they can take care of themselves. But you seemed to have come to that conclusion I'm pretty sure that's not what, for example, the Manhattan Institute is about. You know, there are some bad apples, but in general, I think that there is a genuine concern. It has limits because, you know, most of them aren't black, but I think there is a genuine concern. Was your feeling that there there just wasn't? My um, feeling that justified my own uh, break and ultimate revulsion with some of what they had to say was precisely that that they didn't really care. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that was what I needed to tell myself in order to justify the moves that I was making, which I think at base had other less noble motives, Mm -hmm. which is that I was trying to restore my reputation with uh, the culture barons in the country and not have to live as this, a uh, disgraced and despicable right wing mascot, this black mascot of the right. I wanted out. I couldn't breathe. I wanted to be let back into society. Um, but I can remember William F. Buckley saying something to me once uh, in a small meeting. Uh, he's no longer with us, and I don't think I violated anything by sharing this. He said something like, I'll paraphrase, but this is pretty close. He said, A physician faced with a terminal case, can't be said not to care because he's moved on to the next patient. Hmm. That was his rebuttal, pithy rebuttal to my uh, assertion that we don't care. He says, 
it's not like we don't care. It's like we don't know what to do, and neither do you, and nobody knows what to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's pretty clear that liberal social policy is not fixing this problem. Uh, and moreover, uh, trashing of our institutions, as some people are wont to do, whether it's law enforcement or schools or, you know, uh, uh, civil rights rightly understood or whatever, uh, isn't, uh, isn't helping. Uh, we can't even tell the truth. We can't, we can't even have to actually look the problem in the face. What do you want us to do? Wring our hands? Mm-hmm. Like that. Uh, and I, you know, uh, I don't think it's fair to say of William F. Buckley and uh, uh, people of his ilk that they didn't care about their country or about the least advantaged people in their country. They may have had different views than some about what would make a difference. Maybe they had come to a point of despair and not known what might make a difference short of the kind of thing that you talk about. Um, Or I remember Rick Santorum kind of collaring me at some DC event, probably circa about people need to know this is a former Senator from Pennsylvania. Yeah, he needs to be name-checked now. But he was, <laughs> <laughs> say, 10 years ago and before, and then he fell yeah. about all of various things. But he was saying, you know, why should we Republicans work really for black causes if none of you will vote for us? And I was thinking, this guy isn't, you know, Mr. Charm or Mr. Tact. And this was something he was saying to me personally off yeah. the corner. But I thought, this isn't fun to hear. But I don't know if what he's saying qualifies as racist. I don't know if it's immoral for him to feel that way as a politician. I thought, however, I wouldn't be surprised if this was a common feeling among these people. And so there are going to be limits on how much effort there's going to be. So I completely take your point. Let me make this point also, John. I mean, I I think sometimes, you know, you just have to choose sides. And there's a temptation to want to equivocate. And I believe I feel... Uh, fell into that uh, trap a little bit. You know, I I don't want to actually go where the logic of my thinking is leading me. And so I want to say, I want to have it both ways. I want to say on the one hand, yes, affirmative action is not consistent with the ideal about transracial humanism and about seeing people as human beings, regardless of their racial categorization. I want to say that. Now, on the other hand, I want to say, you can't have a college with 3% African-American in the student body that is, you know, graduating people who go on to be president of the company and congressman and whatnot. The college, if it's elite and a gatekeeper into the elite, has to be diverse. And those two statements are inconsistent and something has to give uh, uh, with them. And one has to make a choice, just like one has to make a choice politically to ally yourself with uh, coalitions that might actually get the opportunity to govern. And those coalitions are going to include people who don't agree with you on every particular uh, instance. And you can't, you can't kind of, you know, have it both ways. Uh, so I, I think, again, me personally, that I, I blinked uh, on stuff that, so you take the colorblind stuff. So I, I can remember some of these conversations that I had. I had one with uh, Justice Thomas in his chambers, in fact, and, I mean, he was basically saying, look, it's rock cutting time now. The shit is hitting the fan. This is a California ballot proposition 209. Uh, the year, if I'm not mistaken, is 1996. Uh, that's I, when that was. That's, yeah. that's when that was on the ballot. And, and this was it, okay? Being put to popular plebiscite, a fundamental question in the nation's largest state, about the limits of race-conscious public policy. That's what got me going. Okay. Such an opportunity is not going to come every year or or every decade. Where do you stand? Now, I went back and read some of those pieces that I wrote in the New Republic, and I'm all over the place, man. I'm for affirmative action, but I'm against affirmative action because I'm, but I'm against it for this reason, but I'm not, you know, blah, blah, blah. I had hair split. I had differences. uh, You know, I had, you know, my mathematical acuity was showing because I had everything worked out to the epsilon and the delta. And it was complete bullshit, John, because the real issue was, are you with us or against us on that? Um, and, I, and I tried to split the difference on that. And that's not the only one. I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I love seeing you yeah. then. I'm wondering, I don't remember finding you to be waffling, but now I don't remember the pieces specifically. <laughs> that's how I learned you reading you there exactly then. And I thought, this is what I believe. But I, now I want to go back to those and see what my opinion would be. Interesting. 
Yeah, uh, I, I, you know, you might well agree with what I was saying because it wasn't like it was it lacked nuance. I mean, in fact, it was all nuance. When I, but the point I'm trying to make was that was not a time to nuance. That, that was a time still, to choose a side and to stand with the side because the, the people on the other side are not BSing. They're serious. Are you sure really it serious. wasn't? Are you sure it wasn't a time for nuance? And so, for example, what one could have said then, and what I've tried to say more clearly then than I started saying right after that, is yes, there needs to be an affirmative action. Is such a a stupid goddamn term at this point. It's so obfuscatory. It should be, yes, you should lower the grades and test scores necessary for admitting a student if they've grown up hard. And then make people realize that there are people who've grown up hard who aren't black too. As opposed to saying no affirmative action, which leaves you open to being completely numb to inequality and its effects and its unfairness in society. Would that have been too subtle? Yeah, because what people like you were talking about were basically saying is no affirmative action. I'm pretty sure that's all Shelby Steele has ever said about it, for example. And I know what he means, but... If well, there's a principle. Um, I, I, so the position that I would take today in retrospect is that was not a time for nuance. That was a time to claim a political victory and to push on because there's a principle that's at stake. And once you start nuancing and compromising the principle, you give you could you see way too much to the other side. This is the position I try to defend today. We don't have time for me to do so at length, but perhaps in another conversation. But in any case, basic point I'm making is I'm looking around and look at the discourse. So a war a law firm in New York City promotes a class of partners to the rank of partner in the firm. It's a big law firm with clients all over the world. I don't know how many they are. Let me say there are a hundred. Okay. They put out a photograph of the new partners in the firm. There are no black faces or too few black faces in the photograph. That becomes a front page story at the New York Times. The law firm is made the target of potential boycotts by organizations that say that if they're not going to put a black or enough blacks in the, uh, and, and Latino in the, um, a new uh, group of partners for the firm, then they shouldn't be getting public business in the state of, uh, you know, whatever, Illinois or, or whatever it might be. And there's stories about this in the newspaper. Now, now, so deeply ingrained has this phony notion that justice requires some kind of population parity in the extent to which African Americans penetrate elite venues of outstanding performance. How do you make partner in a firm? Not because you're buddies with somebody. This idea that there's no such thing as meritocracy and everybody who gets to be partner in a, in a law firm and gets a six hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars a year salary did so because they were in the right fraternity is complete bullshit. We all know that that's one of the most cutthroat competitive venues that you can possibly have. Okay? And people differ in their talents and their capacities to perform. And the low number of African Americans being promoted is probably a very good indicator of the low number performing in such a manner as to warrant their promotion. Okay, so I know that that's contentious, and that's precisely my point. A lot of people will say, I'm a fascist for saying that. Okay, the time to kill this thing was 1996. Okay, it was wrong. The principle that was at stake was much more important than the nuance around the edges of the policy, so you're, which you're only saying, gave the other side new life. You're saying that basically you need to die on the hill of fighting the idea that equal opportunity guarantees equal outcomes. Not That's die on the hill. Not die on the hill. Uh, charge when you see the breach and go all the way through and bayonet those motherfuckers on the other side. That's what you so need to do. Ask you is a genuine question about we should wrap up pretty soon yeah, the yeah. question of partners because I've often thought about this and what goes into making partner and part and probably most of it is competence how many people you bring in etc sure but suppose you are a, a young black woman you as a young black woman are more likely than your white equivalent to go to church on Sunday. 
you are more likely than your white equivalent to not drink or to barely drink. If you are a black identified modern black woman, you might be someone where white people are okay, but it's not your comfort zone. You're really only comfortable with your sisters and your brothers. That's what you do on your weekends. Now, if you were that person, isn't it true or doesn't it stand to reason that you could go into this place and do everything that you're supposed to do? You're going to work over time, sure. but you're not going to have the chemistry with clients that the person, somebody like that calls Becky will. Becky is the, the, the clueless white girl. I know Becky. You are not going to party with everybody because you don't like drinking that much. And even if you do drink, you don't have their sense of humor. You don't watch their TV shows. You didn't see Arrested Development. You don't watch their movies. How you are you, how are you, you different get, from a, a Baptist from Oklahoma City? or um, There are um, those people, and they probably have the same problem, but they're more exactly. black people. And so you get brought into this firm, and when it's time to promote somebody to partner, one, you didn't bring in as many clients because you didn't have the chemistry. Two, if there's a such thing as a good old boy or even good old girl network, and I know there are issues with the gender too, but they don't know you as well because you weren't really at the parties, or even if you were there, you kind of sat there and smiled. Now, that is not that black woman's fault. There are cultural differences, and remember that from law school down to undergraduate school, she was taught to think of white people as people to distrust. She can't help it. So she doesn't get to be partner because she's not one of the white boys. Isn't she, there isn't there some sort of affirmative action necessary under those conditions? I always think about her and her male equivalent. They don't um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it, it seems to me to be a difficult problem of personnel management about how you cultivate and replicate talent within the firm and whatnot. And you know that you've got these social things going on and you want to take them into account. I don't see what race has anything to do with this. It might be more frequent, this kind of uh, uh, a lack of fit. Uh, I'm sure. African Americans, but there are going to be some African Americans who fit right uh, right into. And the, there will be some, well. yeah. Uh, and there are going to be some whites who don't. Um, I think, though, that there is this argument, which is uh, to the extent that schmoozing is a part of the job and you don't do it particularly well for whatever the reasons are, you're not doing the job particularly well. We, after all, did want to keep the business of that particular client. And the way that you were going to keep the business was by making them feel good in your company and you weren't able to do that. Uh, maybe there's another thing that you can do in this firm or someplace else that would, that would be suited to your talents. But that's part of the job. If you're a salesperson and you can't persuade the buyers that they want to buy your stuff, you're not going to get a lot of sales. That's what that's about. It's about persuasion, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. There's also the chip on the shoulder problem. You say yeah. she doesn't feel that comfortable with white people. Well, it's a white person's world. It didn't. Last time I checked. But it's not her fault that world. she drank that stuff in starting when she went to college. She's surrounded by it. I have seen that happen with black women and men. They come to college and they are infiltrated with that idea that they've got to watch out, that what makes them special is that they are trying to thrive in this culture of white people who are subtly set against them. And so don't, think, the, they, don't, don't the senior don't, partners get to ask? Don't they get to ask what kind of firm are we going to have if we've got uh, 20 or 30 percent of our partners who are at a right angle uh, to the rest of the social norms that we have in the firm? Really, we have to remake ourselves? They might this ask. Stuff, this stuff, that's why this stuff is hard. Because, yeah, if I were running the firm, I'm Brad, or whoever th this person is. Yeah, I mean, after a certain point, if it's about the bottom line, I really can't be bothered with thinking about why I'm going to, I want to give this person one of the names I give people. Let's call the guy, the, it's a black guy named Raymond. Raymond is not going to make partner because, frankly, Raymond clearly doesn't like us very much. And Raymond always goes home while we all go out drinking. Now, are they supposed to change that and give Raymond the partnership based on different parameters than they gave the partnership to Ethan? That's a tough one. But it means that these things are, are complicated. And that's why somebody might say, yes, procedure needs to be changed because you're implying that Raymond doesn't deserve to be partner. I don't mean that, I don't mean to imply that it, I don't mean to make a statement about dessert, but I do mean about utility. You know, I mean, maybe he's not the right partner if he's not with the thing. But but I, I want to say something here because I don't want to leave the wrong impression. Organizational cultures are up for um, contestation all the time before any black people came along, Jewish people came along or whatever. OK. And organizations had to adapt and they had to 
change and, and reinvent themselves. Uh, and there's an entirely uh, appropriate role that customers can play who are patronizing a firm to say, I'm looking at the uh, organizational culture of your firm, and I see that it's not especially friendly to people of color. I happen to be a person of color or do business with them, and I actually don't want to do business with you if I don't feel comfortable with the way your organization is being run. That's the real world. And when that real world message comes through, the old guys upstairs at the top uh, offices on the top floor will have a meeting and think it through because, after all, they want to make money. They are business to make money, nothing else. So, so I shouldn't be so cavalier about this, um, although I think the idea I'm an outsider, I don't feel comfortable here, is more often than not an excuse for people who uh, the real challenge is a challenge of, of uh, mastery over the, over the craft at hand. That is extremely inconvenient, and also I would agree with you. That is true, and if you have a competence problem, whatever the reason you have it, and usually the competence problem, I think, ultimately traces to very subtle cultural factors. It is something that is available to you in today's culture in particular to say that the problem is that people don't like me. Yes, that is definitely the case. And you will be listened to by a certain kind of person. And that does make these things even harder to actually grapple with in any kind of productive way. Well, you know, somebody comes back from the first meeting and uh, uh, they're sitting around with their friends and they say, I didn't see anybody in the room who looked like me. Well, that's just got to go. You know, who looked like me? You mean no, who that, had brown skin? Brown skin is something? Brown no, skin that, is nothing. That line has just got to go. You never hear a Chinese-American person say it. You never hear a Chinese person say it. Why in the world do we have to have people around who, quote, unquote, look like us? If I ever hear one of my daughters saying that, I'm going to take them to therapy. Yeah, that one is just perfectly weak. Yes. John, we've, we've done a uh, your books, My Little Humble Effort, uh, discussion here. I think it's been it's been informative. This has been <laughs> this was supposed to be about Kamala Harris. We have to we have to do that one next. Okay, well let's do it next in a couple of weeks or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, this Thanks was a for neat your time. Thank you.